Today, are you ready for the message? Yes. How many are ready for the message today? Yes. Okay, I'm going to speak today, bear with me here, on a dirty bow, four letter word. And so, with that said, it's probably going to elicit a, a, a response out of you. I'm warning you now, we're going to have to put, a, put aside religion. Just for a moment. Well, maybe not just for a moment. Maybe we should just put aside religion altogether yeah. and get into relationship and, and re representing Christ's love in, in society. But it's going to be a word. I might cause you to throw stuff at me, write me emails, and so on and so forth. I'm a little nervous about saying this word in church. I've ne I, well, I shouldn't say Yeah, I'll just leave that alone. Um, But it could it could offend you, and I, I are you ready for the word? Are you ready for it? Is religiosity off? Can we put that off for a moment? I mean, if you really have to put it on afterwards, you can put it on afterwards. But come on, this just for a moment. Um, you know, maybe for some of you younger kids, you might want to put your fingers in your ears. Um, because this word may shock you, and it may be a word that maybe your parents are trying to shelter you from. Um, but Lord, I'm going to ask you to forgive me right now before I even say the word. The heart's racing. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, here we go. The word is wait. The word is wait. It's such a foul, dirty word in the church that, what, we got to wait for something? And then in today's American world, oh, wait, don't tell me to wait for anything. I mean, come on, we live in an instant society. We, we live in a society where we have instant pudding, instant mashed potatoes. Come on, we live in a society where, where there's instant oatmeal. Nobody has the time to wait for oatmeal to cook anymore. <laughs> Nobody likes to wait for the pudding to set up, so we have instant pudding. Uh, come on, we, we have microwaves, because we can't wait to cook a meal from an oven or a stove. We have drive through restaurants now. Now? Yes, now. We have had them for a long time, but they're still around. <laughs> they haven't gone away. They haven't gone away because people haven't said, no, I'm going to pass McDonald's today. I'm going to cook a home, home cooked meal. So we, we live in this, this, this time... Where even in the church, the word is the word wait is just not a receptive word. People don't like it, especially when God says wait. Yeah. And God says wait sometimes. Yeah. Are you okay today? Yeah. Let me let me let me say this: a woman's car stalled in traffic. Has anybody ever had that happen before? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. it stalls in traffic. She looked in vain under the hood to identify the cause, while the driver behind her leaned relentlessly on his horn. Finally, she had enough. She walked back to his car and offered sweetly, I mind you, I don't know what's the matter with my car, but if you want to go look under the hood, I'll be glad to stay here and hump for you. <laughs> okay, let's be honest today. How many of us have fallen asleep at a red light? <laughs> I have. Um, but how many of us have been in a red light and you're behind a car or two or three and the light's green, you can see it go green, and you're sitting there going on your steering wheel going, come on, we're not moving yet, what's the problem? Come on. And then sometimes you feel bad like you're four cars behind, but you'll do it four cars behind, you'll honk the horn. If you're the first car behind, you will honk. But if that person behind you, four cars behind hops, you're hoping that the person in front of you that's, that's not moving doesn't think it's you. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk today about a passage I think we're all familiar with, and it's Isaiah 40, 31. Uh, in the New King James Version, it says this, but those who wait, everybody say wait, wait. on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
Father, we thank you for the beautiful, foul, four-letter word we're going to talk about today. Father, we thank you that your word actually says a lot in Scripture about waiting upon you. Father, I pray that your spirit would be released over this place to take the words that you've given me for this church today in this season of time in each of our lives and begin to bring life out of us um, and, and renew us, Lord, and to strengthen us and to, 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 to just radically change us no matter where we're at today. In Jesus' name, amen. So let me give you some quick background um, on this verse because I'm pulling it at the very end of the chapter and, and obviously there's uh, how many chapters before this? 39 chapters before this, but this is actually a time in Israel's history where they're actually in captivity. They're under the captivity of the Babylonians, and Isaiah is actually prophesying the word of the Lord to them, this, this passage. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up, um, up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here's... Here's the thing. God had warned, out of his love, he continued to warn and warn and warn Israel that as they continue to walk contrary to his ways, that there would be a time where God would say, you know what, if you're going to continue to do that, I'm going to allow you to be under bondage to another nation. You're going to serve another nation. And so he warned, okay, this is God's love to warn us, to say, hey, you're off track, let's get back on. And so as, as he was warning, they continue not to heed. They continue to kick against the goads of, of God's warning. And time actually came, and many prophets spoke it. Time actually came where God said, okay, they're not willing. They're stubborn. How many of us are stubborn in here today? I know I, I can be very stubborn. But, but uh, as, as time moved on, God finally came to a point where he goes, okay, they don't want to heed my word, so captivity it will be. And so Isaiah is prophesying this and speaking to this to the people in a place of bondage, in a place of captivity. You could say it's a place of a valley that he is speaking this and he's giving them hope. Hope that there would be an end to this. And if you remember Old Testament history, God not only prophesied that he was going to put them in captivity if they didn't change their ways, but he also said he also set a time limit on it. Isn't that awesome? So this wasn't something that, okay, you failed, you're done, that's it, you're gone. He put a time limit on it, and he is true to his word. And as time came, that 70 years, he began to bring them out of captivity. He began to work on the heart of the, the king at that time, of the nation they were serving under, to move it, to begin to release them, to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And the people came back and rebuild the walls in Nehemiah, and so on and so on. I just gave you thousands of years of quick history of the Old Testament. Amen? How many like history? So today, you know, we live in a, in, in a time today where the DIY is a reality. Do it yourself. And it took me a long time to figure that out when I'd be going through the different channels on the TV and they would have a show, Do It, or DIY. I'm like, well, what the heck is DIY? It took me probably about two years to figure out, oh, do it yourself. <laughs> because those kind of channels I don't stop on and watch because I'm not interested in it because I'm not a do-it-yourself kind of guy. Usually when I do it myself, it makes it worse, and so there's more work, and then i got to call people like Jack in to fix it. And, and Jack's thinking right now, well, go do some work on your house. <laughs> well, come fix it. But uh, uh, we live in a society today where everything is becoming about doing it yourself. And you know, it's, it's good if you want to, if you're crafty and you know how to do it yourself, it's good to do home repairs, it's, it's good to do a remodel, or whatever it is you want to do, whatever you turns your heart on and that kind of stuff, tear a car apart, put it back together, who, who really cares? But when it comes to our Christian walk, it's not meant to do it yourself. It's not. And the problem is when we do it ourselves, what we, what we do is we find ourselves off track when we do it ourselves, what we do is we begin to become weary and tired because we're doing it in our own strength. And God's walk for us isn't meant to be done in our own strength because he knows our human nature cannot do it. Yeah. It cannot do it. That's why we need his presence in our life. And when we couple his presence with our will to, to surrender what we want to do and, and do it his way, that's where life begins to be better. And I'm not saying today in this message that you'll never have a valley, that you'll never go through difficult times, because the last few weeks of messages are all pointing to the thing that God wants to do something in your life. Amen. And sometimes he leads us down 
roads that are going to refine and do things. Yes. And it's all for a purpose. And so um, uh, that's exactly what got Israel in trouble. They decided they wanted to do it their own way. And they re rejected the God, their God. We, we see, like, in Scripture, and I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to highlight it here in 1 Samuel 10, 8, when Samuel goes to King Saul, and he says, hey, go to Gilgal and wait there. And you know the story. He went to Gilgal. It was only supposed to be seven days he was supposed to wait. Well, Samuel got a little delayed. Come on. How many of you sometimes when, when, when God has spoken something and there's an idea in us that it's a little delayed, now we get a little antsy? Come on. And that's when the whole do-it-yourself, I'm going to help God come into the picture. And then you go in. Ironically, I know in my own life when that happens and I begin to do it myself, I find out that I muddy the waters and make it worse. Come on. Anybody ever been there before? And so David or, or, or Saul began to simply do this. Come on, Samuel. Where are you? Where are you? And he began to do, go into an operation that he was never called to do. He began to sacrifice uh, animals and, and stuff like that. And God never called him to do that. That was Samuel's job. He was supposed to wait for Samuel, but he was too antsy, and so he did. And I think many times that's us. Right. I think that's the church today in America, especially where things aren't going to the speed we want to go. God has said, hey, trust me. Wait, I'm doing something here. But we want to, no, 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 I know better, God. How many of us know better than God? Yeah. I know better. And then we begin to step in and try to be God, and we mess it up. Yeah. Right. Now, not that God can't ever fix that, but we probably may bring more hardship on ourselves than we need to because God's moving and God's uh, working in our lives. So let's look at this word wait, and what does it mean? Um, I think when we think of the word wait, we think immediately delay. Or not now. Or maybe deep down inside when you hear the word wait, maybe you mean, well, that's never going to happen. Then. But in the Hebrew, it means this. Are you ready? Wait. No, it means more than that. It means look for, hope, trust, expect, to wait or look eagerly for, to linger for, and to bind together. Okay. Now, I don't want to go in, into uh, I don't want to go into all those first, you know, the way to look for, hope, trust, expect. I think we can go safely. The last couple of weeks, we can tie that into what I talked the last couple of weeks. Um, I would say that the New Living Translation translates it correctly when it says, "But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength." Okay? They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Um, but this morning, I want to look at that, that word, the wording, bind it together. Because I believe it's the main key to how we wait on the Lord. And I believe it's the main key on how we come out the other end. Um, so to bind together gives us a visual. And it means this. It means to bind together like a cord. But it's, it's not like tying a cord around some sticks or something like that. It's, it's not even about the sticks. It's about the rope. And, and the rope is made up of small strands of strings. And they take those small strands of strings and they weave them and they intertwine them with other ones. Okay? So understand this real quick, that when we're looking at the word wait here, and we're looking at the word bind together, we're not to bind together ourselves with the world or things in the world or possessions of the world or even to another person. We are to bind and weave and, and, and string together our life with God. Amen. With God. Okay? And so... When, when, uh, when we go through this process and, 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 and the strings are woven and weaved together, have you ever, how many of you have ever, ever looked at a rope before? So what they do is they make smaller ropes, depending on the gauge of it, and then they take those and they string them and weave them all together to make a big rope. The bigger the rope, the stronger it is. Are you with me? Yeah. The bigger the rope, the stronger it is. And so I want to read this verse again, 
And I want to insert that definition. But those who bind together, but those who bind themselves together with the Lord shall renew their strength. If you don't bind yourself together with, with the Lord, you're binding yourself together with something else. Your strength will not ever be found in something else. Your strength will only be found in the Lord. Are we, are we good? Yeah, that's good. Come on. And then in these times of waiting, in these times of binding and weaving together, the Lord is doing an internal work in you and me. Again, everything about our life is an internal work. And when God begins to do the internal work, he's, he's doing it first inside because it's going to produce something out of us outside. Amen. Listen, I've, I've done church for a long time. And it's real easy for a season to make your outward body do something that looks religious, but you can only do it in your own strength for so long. Yeah. Right. Right. And the time's going to come when the true you is going to come out because you can only do it so long. Right. But when God gets a hold of our heart and begins to work on the inside, it's going to produce a natural outflow. Amen. Because the inside, God is doing that work. It's like a river. And that river is going to begin to flow. And that river is going to begin to reveal Christ in us. Right. Amen? Amen? So, God, God is wanting to forge diamonds in us. And we all know how diamonds are made, right? right. Lumps of coal that are pressurized greatly by the earth. And, and, a, and a precious gem comes out of it. We know how gold is done. It's refined. So God's in this promise or this process of making out of you and me diamond and diamonds and gold. Rings, if you will. And we'll put on our fingers showing that we're married to him and him alone. But in that, he's, he's trying to create a stronger foundation in all of us so he can build a great house upon us. Amen. Okay? So look at this. The Chinese bamboo tree. Now, before I go on with this, when we were in Hawaii, I think last year it was, I think, no, two years ago, whenever it was, we were uh, um, on uh, Maui and we went on the road to Hana, and we stopped at the bamboo forest. It was an amazing sight. If you've ever, never been in a bamboo forest, one thing, what I liked about it was once you entered it, it was cool. We got out of the heat, got into the cool. It was refreshing to me. Everybody else might have been cold. I think Laura well, fell on the floor in the mud and in a fetus position and started sucking her thumb. But hey, you know, whatever warms you up, right? But it was cool. I think I remember it was it was I think it was Bryant that was trying to do some movie, so he he kind of got up one of the the shoots, one of the bamboo trees, and then he was trying to walk from limb to limb on it. And guess what? It totally supported him. When I got on it, it went <laughs> snap. No, no. I wasn't even going to try to get up on that. But so the Chinese bamboo tree is one of the most remarkable plants on earth. Once the gardener plants the seed, he will see nothing but a single shoot coming out of the bulb. For five full years, that's all he sees is a single little shoot. That tiny shoot, however, must have daily food and water. During all the time the gardener is caring for the plant, the exterior shoot will grow less than an inch. Wow. At the end of five years, however, Chinese bamboo will perform an incredible feat. It will grow an amazing 90 feet tall in only 90 days. So let me ask you this. When did, when did it actually grow? Now we would... We would say after five years when it really sprung up. But the key is what was going on during those five years. And what was going on was the way God created that, that Chinese bamboo tree was this. Those five years is all about the foundation. Yeah, amen. It's all about the root system. Yeah. It goes deep and it goes wide. Why? Because it has to be able to support the height of it. And if it didn't have the root system, it wouldn't be able to support it. It's kind of like a palm tree. Right. Palm trees are one of the strongest trees on the face of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. And their root system is insane. Yeah. Go research it out some. It is absolutely insane. And that's why when hurricanes come with 160 mile an hour winds, they're still standing. 
And if they break, they usually break in the middle. They don't get uprooted. They just break in the middle, which is pretty significant. Okay? And so um, I, I say that to just illustrate that God's doing a work in us, and it's a great work. And one thing I just want to encourage right now, just even in that in the church, is we gotta we gotta come to a place of understanding this bamboo illustration in the in each of our individual lives and give one another some grace as they're going through the process of maturing in Christ. I think the church is really good about crucifying itself when somebody messes up or what have you, but we gotta learn to give grace because God's still doing a work in the person. He's still doing a work in you. And if the church fights each other, what's that going to do? It's going to destroy the church itself. And so we got to learn to give grace to one another. Amen? Amen. So God is doing an internal work, work in us so he can take us to new and greater heights. So waiting in the Bible isn't some foreign concept either. I can give you a plethora of examples of waiting, and I'm going to give you a few here, and I'm not going to go into them, I'm just going to jog your memory. So Abraham and Sarah yeah. had to wait for Isaac. How about Noah? Yeah. Go build me an ark. Why? There's going to be a flood. When? It's not for you to worry about. There's going to be a flood. So he had to go do his part, build, and wait for a flood to come. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, he had to wait for the flood, but then he had to wait for the water to subside. A lot of water. Yeah. Okay, how about Joseph? The dreams as a young child, the, the, the prophetic dreams that the Lord gave him, but he had to wait before he actually entered into that place of authority in Egypt. How about David? Come on, guys. He was anointed king at, at a very young age and never sat on the throne until 12 or 14 years later. Yeah. That's a wait. Yeah. Jesus had to wait. <gasps> what? Yeah, he had to wait for the time to be fulfilled. Yeah. There was the proper time that God had for him to even start his ministry. How about Mary and, Mary and Martha? Kind of goes on with the example of Jer Jairus last week that I used in the message. Lazarus died. And they had to wait for Jesus to get there. And they had to actually wait longer than Jairus had to wait. I think Jesus showed up late to that one. Lazarus, in all intents and purposes, would start to be smelling. But when he spoke, Lazarus, come forth. Somebody got up. It wasn't Donnie. It was Lazarus. Okay? How about the disciples? What did Jesus tell them when he ascended into heaven? Go to Jerusalem and wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And they only had to wait 10 days. Yeah. How about us? What are you waiting for today? What are you waiting for in this season of your life? Whether it be a valley, whether it be relationship problems, uh, to be healed, whatever it is, what are you waiting for? I know one thing we're all waiting for, and that's the return of Christ. So we're all waiting for something. If we don't have it, life is perfect for you right now, hallelujah. Yeah. But we're all still waiting for Christ to return. <laughs> but I want you to, to understand that the key to this verse is the waiting. Right. Waiting gives renewed strength. Yeah. Yeah. Which, that word itself is really interesting because it's, it's not, it's exchanging what we have for something better. It's just not like Jesus coming up and giving us a uh, like a car battery where you hook up the things to it and you give it a little jump start. No, it is a literal exchanging our strength for his strength. And that's so awesome because his strength is perfect. Amen. His strength is the very thing that we all need to get through this life that we're going through. Uh, when we operate in his unlimited strength, we can climb like eagles. How many love eagles in here? I, I love around here to actually find them when they're out flying around. And I love, if I'm in a car, I'll pull over for a little bit and just watch them. I've been on walks before um, around our house. One Saturday morning I was for a walk. Was, I think we were fasting at that time. I was like, hey, what better to do than to go for a walk? 
But I was blessed that day to see eight eagles. Eight eagles all flying really, really high up there. I think they even had some young, young ones up there because I couldn't see the white on it yet. Um, and so what a beautiful sight that is. I know Kent loves eagles. He used to be up in Alaska, has lots of pictures of eagles and stuff like that. But the scripture says that we will mount up on wings like eagles. Okay? So how does an eagle fly? Did it just, as a little young eagle, does it just jump out of the nest and go, hey, I'm out of here. I'm flying the coop. No, I want to explain to you how an eagle learns to fly. The mother grabs it by their claws, and I'm assuming, depending on whether they were a difficult child or not, is how much they <laughs> squeeze into that, into that young eagle. But the mother will take it and fly it up really high in the sky and let it go. And just let it fall to the earth. Isn't that amazing? You either learn or you die. But it, there's an illustration of God's goodness here. Because the mother eagle takes it really high and lets it go. And it has time to figure it out. But all the while, the mother eagle is really close by. And as it's getting closer and closer, if the, if the young eagle doesn't figure it out, the mother swoops in and grabs it again. And then takes it back up and lets it go. And this process will continue to happen over and over again until that bird learns how to fly. Isn't that amazing? But listen, that's what God's doing in your, your my life. He's trying to take us higher. He's trying to teach us how to fly. He's trying to get a foundation in us that will be a lasting foundation that's not going to uh, crack or crumble under difficult times or difficult cir circumstances. He's trying to get us to soar like eagles. Amen. And it can only be done by his strength. Amen. And as he's taking us through these things, as, as that mother eagle takes, takes that eagle up high and lets it go, God is with us. He's in the, the trials. He's in the testings. He's in the growing and the, and the refining and the making of a jewel that you are. He's with us all along. Yeah. He's not going anywhere. He's not dropping us and going, okay, I'm out of here. If you don't fly real quick, you're going to die. And I guess I'll see you in heaven. That's not God. He has a plan for you and I today in this church and in your personal life and in our culture. He has a plan. Because he's trying to accomplish something in Kitsap County, and he's going to do it through you. He's going to do it through me. And that's simply this, to shine the love of God and to see the lost get saved. Amen. That's why we're here, church. Amen. I mean, I think we get caught up in the world system today where, where we think we're here just to go make a paycheck. Yeah, we, we need a paycheck. There's no doubt about that. But God has a purpose in making the, even the paycheck. That's right. Amen? Amen. Amen? i got to get going here. So let me give you four keys to waiting. Oh, I don't have my keys. I must have left them somewhere. So here's the first key. Know God's promises. You know, it helps to know what God has said. Because if you don't know what God has said, what God has said then fear is going to come in. Now, I'm not saying that there are people in here that know what God has said, but there still isn't fear there. But there's still a hope. Come on, and what God says is going to happen. Maybe you're here today and, and you're struggling with a particular sin or something. <laughs> Let me just remind you today, God's grace is sufficient for you to have victory in that area. Yes. But it's also his righteousness that covers you. Yes. Now, I don't say that, and you know me, I don't say that just say, hey, Christianity is all about sin. Do whatever you want, it's all good. That's not me, that's not the word of God. But his grace is sufficient and his, his righteousness will cover our mistakes, our sins, our errors. Yeah. Okay? So we got to understand the word. We've got to get in at church. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have heard that about a million times in this church? Yes. <laughs> okay? We gotta, and you know what? Don't turn off the fact that Pastor Tim's always saying we've got to get in at the word. Because there's a reason we've got to know the word. Because yeah. it's going to reveal who he is. His promises. Okay? And just as a reminder... You're his son or you're his daughter. He cares for you. And he wants to reveal himself. And he does that through his word. Yeah. Then we've got to rest in his character. Okay, as we understand the word word and the, the word more and more, 
uh, it will bring us into a deeper insight of who he is and his character. When you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you, he cares for you, he sees what you're going through, he hasn't abandoned you, he hasn't forsaken you, it's an easier place to rest in than not knowing that. Okay? Um, num number three, rely on his love. Okay? As you get in the word, you're going to understand uh, his promises, you're going to understand his character, but you're also going to begin to understand the unfathomable love of God. You're going to begin to see, even as it says in, in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it is, that we can come to a place of understanding the width and the length and the depth and the height of his love. Come on. And his care for you. It's all in the word. And, and then number four, we'll come to a place of understanding his life is in us. His life is in us. John 1, 4 says this, in him was life. Speaking of Jesus, in Jesus was life. And that word life there is zoe in the Greek, Z-O-E. And in its simplest form is the fullness of salvation. Without going into all those details, it's the fullness of salvation. It says this in Romans 8.1. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I'm going to repeat that because I didn't hear any amens. <laughs> The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Amen. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Amen. That is a promise we can stake a claim on. It's a promise we can live by. That if you need something, if you need strength, God's the place to go. Amen. Amen? So it's been said that when God wants to grow a mushroom, he can do it overnight. But when he wants to grow a mighty oak, it takes a few years. What, we, what do we want to be, a mushroom or an oak? If we want to be an oak, it is well worth the wait. So what do we do while we're waiting? Now we'll close with this. Psalm 25, 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. See, while we're waiting, we want to continue to move forward. Not only in our relationship with God, but being transformed by His love. Right. We don't want to compromise our walk or our relationship with Him. And I know, and come on, I know when you're going through some very deep valleys and stuff, there is that, 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 this, that, that deep burning inside where you just want to throw the hat. You want to throw the towel in. You want to give up. And I want to encourage you today, don't give up on God. He's doing a work in your life, and he's doing a work of, like, like the uh, bamboo root system. He's doing a work in you that we don't even see. And then he's also working on circumstances that surround us to bring about what he's doing in your life. He's not going to leave you to die in the valley. But he's going to lift you up. Um, I want to read just a, a, some lyrics, and this is my closing, by the way, part of my closing. Um, there was a song called While I'm Waiting, uh, and it was done by John Waller uh, a few years back. And I just want to read some of the lyrics. It says this, while I'm waiting, I'm waiting on you, Lord. And I am hopeful, I am waiting on you, Lord. Though it is painful, but patiently I will wait. And I will move ahead bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. While I'm waiting, I serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship you. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I while I wait. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on you, Lord, and I'm peaceful. Whew. I'm peaceful, I'm waiting on you, Lord. Though it is not easy, no, but faithfully I will wait. Yes, I will wait. And it goes on through the chorus numerous times, but it says this at the very end, I will serve you while I'm waiting. And I think that illustrates very powerfully our demeanor as we wait on whatever it is we're waiting for the Lord to do in our life. Is that while we're waiting, we're still moving forward. We're still worshiping. We're still serving. We're still engaged in community and relationships and stuff like that. We don't pull ourselves back and go, woe is me. We, we actually, that's the worst thing you can do. 
because God designed the church to be a support system when you're going through things like this, to get prayer and encouragement and exhortation. Come on, maybe a beat down. No, I'm joking. Um, but it, it, it's just a, an awesome uh, lyrics to a song that fits perfectly here. Um, and I, I think I want to close right here with one last. Um, I will close right here. No, it's good. Isaiah 64.4 says this. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. And I'm going to add this, who bind themselves together with them.